Are we ready to start the workshop? Okay. Yeah, Great. I think so. <clears throat> I'll share my screen again. Mm -hmm. So what I was hoping that we could do is do something of what I like to call a pressure cooker exercise. And what a pressure cooker exercise means is that you don't usually have all of the ingredients that you need, but you just kind of jump in and do your best for 20 minutes. Just kind of throw everything into the ring. So I understand that you all have some working groups. So I would suggest either you can work in groups for 20 minutes, or you can also work as individuals. I guess it's up to you. Um, usually we're smarter as groups, but what I would like to suggest is that you reflect on a city that you and your group know well. So it could be Bergen, it could be a, an international city that you've all spent time in, or you could choose a case city that one of you knows quite well. And what I would like you to do is to kind of use your brains now to think about the politics of mobility matrix that I introduced in this lecture. And I'll show that slide again here right after. And think about how it actually applies to the city that you choose to focus on. So we could say we're thinking about Sao Paulo in Brazil, or we wanna think about um, Beijing in China, or we wanna think about Bergen in Norway. What kind, how does this actually apply? And is it, is it realistic or do you wanna challenge it? Do you see it looking quite differently? Um, so that's the first question I'd like you to reflect upon. Based on kind of your understanding of the politics of mobility in that city, I would like you to, to reflect upon what kind of street fights actually exist. And once again, those street fights focus on allocation of space, right? Is there a lot of space allocated to public transit and to green mobilities in your city? Or do we see a more car dominated landscape? If so, what kind of struggles are happening every day in kind of decision making? Uh, Devin brought up one of the street fights that's happening in Bergen, right? That we have this political party kind of challenging the tolling. Other things like that could be brought up as an example. And how do these street fights help us understand just and inclusive mobilities? And I, I recognize that I haven't really gone into definition here, but I would like to challenge you because this is a PhD course how do you understand justice? How do you in, in understand inclusivity here, right? And we can bring that up as a discussion as well. And lastly, um, who is able to actually exercise rights of mobility in your city? Are there certain groups that have more mobility than others? And is this based potentially on like issues of race or ability, socioeconomic status? And then if we see it from kind of a more structural system perspective, who governs and controls mobility systems in the city that you're thinking about. So this is of course a lot of ingredients to put into the pressure cooker, right, for 20 minutes. But as I said, we're oftentimes smarter in groups. So see what you can do over the next 20 minutes. And then I would like to bring this up in discussion in the last, as I understand, we have 15 minutes afterwards or yeah, something like that. So uh, right now it is uh, 10.05, so let's meet back around um, 10.25 in this group. And I'll show you the next slide, which is the politics of mobility. Does anybody need me to go back to the previous slide so you can take a screenshot? The question's in the chat as well, so you should have those available in your groups. So I'll just leave it on this slide here, okay? And we'll meet back here um, at 10.25. Any questions or can, confusion around that? can't really see is is everyone back or popping back in a couple of seconds okay cool cool and timing wise do we have till 10 45 or 10 50 yeah. yeah all right we're good to go great cool so I understand that you all are broken up into four groups. Is that how it is? Yeah, 
Cool. Is there a group that would like to start maybe just diving into one of the questions? Um, of course, you're welcome to, to touch on some of the others. Eva, you're the you're the person that I can see on my screen, so I'm going to be a little bit unfair and, and pick on you and your group. Do you guys want to start by kind of yeah. uh, bringing up some of the the aspects that were discussed in in your breakout? And it's okay if it's more questions than actual yeah. solutions. So I can uh, maybe try try to sum it up for our group. Perfect. So as, uh, we're discussing uh, the the city of Vienna, where I am based at the moment, and which we yeah. all to a degree new. Yeah. And um, well, I'm honestly not, or we all were not too familiar with uh, mobility in Vienna. Mm -hmm. But in general, I think um, to many spheres of um, public society, Vienna is very much renowned for its rather social approach mm -hmm. to social housing. And I think also to a degree, uh, transportation in that they have like a 365 days ticket, which you pay 365 euros. So it's one euro per day. And I think in relation to other metropolitan areas in Europe, that makes public transportation quite cheap. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also, yeah, they, they somehow stylize uh, their, their transportation system as the, the heroes of everyday life and, so um, I think that, that there's a, some, the Viennese people like their transportation system very much. Mm -hmm. And um, biking is not such a big thing, but works all right. And they have bike fast lanes, but uh, I think it's, that is not such, such a big issue at Vienna. Mm -hmm. And so I would say it's, it's overall rather a social democratic discourse on public transportation and stuff. But on the other hand, cars are also very uh, important here. And I don't know much about the way that um, different yeah, politics are discussing the role of the, the car in the city, except for one example. And that is that uh, the, the center city, the old sort of medieval center, um, is discussed to be car free by 2022, I think. Mm -hmm. And this is a, 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 a pretty open discussion, or it seems to be a pretty open discussion among most uh, parties in charge, which are social democratic and conservative parties. Interesting. Uh, question. So, so, what you outlined there is that there's a clear kind of progressive politics of mobility. A link to affordable housing, and I know Vienna is actually outstanding in terms of the amount of affordable housing. What is it? Sixty percent of all residents are living in affordable housing. Yeah, uh, I think roughly. Yeah. yeah, and then there's also this affordable public transit. So those two kind of help us see that there's a strong leftist progressive, which means there's redistribution by the government, actual um, you know programs put in place to ensure equity, yet. As you suggested, there's also a real strong politics of the car, right? So the fact that you have to have a discussion around creating a car-free center means, in, means that there is some sort of a discussion or potentially a political fight over reallocating that space. And it would be really interesting to think about going to that next question. Now you've outlined a potential street fight. How, do these street, how does that street fight kind of help us understand just and inclusive mobilities in the city? So while there's affordable public transit, maybe there's kind of a, a barrier to actually having um, a more kind of active transportation in the city, whether it be walking or bicycling and specifically having kind of a safe public transit um, or a, a safe um, cycling culture. So it would be interesting to look at um, like how safe it is actually to ride a bicycle in Vienna. I think it's not very safe, yeah. pretty dangerous actually. Yeah, yeah. 
Thank you. That was an interesting summary. Did you guys have an opportunity to kind of think about who's able to exercise rights of mobility or who governs and controls mobility systems? Um, yeah, shortly. We, uh, I think, um, also seen this, um, well, not a phenomenon, but um, the, the, the observation that um, riding a bike is uh, certainly more a thing of the white middle class, I would say, mm -hmm. and probably also very, m or to yeah, to a degree uh, related to um, rather lifestyle decisions than that of uh, well the the need or mobility of transportation. And from my view, I think um, public transport in this regard seemed. To be uh, a little more mixed or average mm -hmm. in, in relation to the, the city's population, I think. So what? it's been, it's more accessible. So there's been kind of a decision on the, the part of the government to actually make it accessible for everybody, whereas cycling maybe is not as accessible. Yeah, I think that, mm -hmm. well, that I couldn't prove that empirically, but I, uh, I think it's an it's, impression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. What's another city that, that came from a different group? Um, in our group, we couldn't find a city that we were all familiar with. So we each brought our own case studies and talked about them together to kind of help us understand each of our cities in turn. Yeah. Um, and so the city that I bought was the one that I live in, which is Norwich in the UK. Yep. And listening to Luca's talk, I feel like it's taken a completely opposite approach. Um, so Norwich is, is a medium-sized city, um, and it's just, it's so car-centric. Like, there is a bus system, but it's very expensive. It's like four times more expensive than a London bus mm -hmm. um, for a journey that takes about 10 minutes. And... Um, the timetable is really um, infrequent as well. So I think there's two buses an hour and they stop around eight o'clock in the evening. So mm. always great. Um, and yeah, I, like the city, Norwich is trying to promote itself as a cycling city, but there's really not much cycling infrastructure at all. Um, and I'm not sure if it's a UK thing, but definitely I feel it here. There's a lot of conflict between car drivers and cyclists. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of aggression as well towards cyclists. So maybe I'm more aware of it because I used to live in the Netherlands as well, which is very much, you know, bike friendly. Um, but yeah, I'd say like when I was thinking about street fights, that's what I thought of was the conflict that you get between cyclists and other road users. Yep. Um, there's a lot of problems with congestion in my city. Um, and the way that they're dealing with it is by building a new ring road and then another new ring road and then kind of just increasing the capacity for cars, but without actually reducing um, like the need for people to use cars. And I think because there aren't many alternatives, like a lot of people don't see cycling as safe and the public transport system isn't, um, isn't that effective. Mm -hmm. um, most people have cars and use cars to travel quite short distances because the city itself isn't big at all. Um, but yeah, it's just, yeah, I think a conflict is all between like recognizing that congestion is a problem, but then just creating the, or enabling it to become even more of a problem by creating more roads and space dedicated to cars. Um, Another thing that came up thinking about street fights was that we have a, a car sharing scheme in my city mm -hmm. um, and they have designated parking bays um, all over the city. Um, but residential parking, you need a permit for. And so when they were installing this, there were groups of people who didn't want a parking bay on their street dedicated to a car that none of them actually own, even right. though it would benefit you know, the community to have one of those cars here. Mm -hmm. Um, so I feel like it's a very much a, an individualistic, like I have my car, don't take away my parking space, even mm -hmm. though, you know, greater good. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was... So, yeah, yeah, this is a very interesting kind of classic example. I mean, I could also, uh, it could have been any town in the United States that you were also talking about, I would suggest, um, and, and many other places um, as well. 
if you were to reflect on kind of the broad politics of mobility that I brought up in, in the matrix where we have kind of left or progressive, we have neoliberal and then we have conservative, what kind of ideology do you think um, is dominating in Norwich? Um, I'm not sure. And we talked about this a little bit with the group and I wasn't, I wasn't too sure. Like we have a, a left wing city government, but I just think the culture that we have here as well is very much around the car and people owning and using their own car. So I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. It almost feels like there's not really a conflict because it's just the way that things always have been. And it's expected mm. that you will just like perpetuate this cycle. Um, mm. But yeah, I, I struggle to try and kind of fit it into like one of these, um, one of these boxes. I mean, I kind of want to say it's probably conservative then for like preserving the space dedicated to cars. Um, but I feel like that goes against what my city doing in other regions, in other sectors as well. Um, well, I think you bring up kind of an interesting anecdote or story here because if we, and of course this matrix um, can be seen as overly simplistic. Uh, when applied in a real location, it becomes variegated and very much depends on the local situation. So then within a local context, what is left and progressive? That's the question that we have to raise. And what you can say is if the discourse or the idea of mobility has been pushed so far to the right that a left or progressive approach is like, okay, we put in a car sharing port here, or we have a car sharing, like it's still all about the politics of the car instead of being about the politics of green mobility. Right. Yeah. So that's that's kind of what I'm gleaning from what you're saying without really understanding Norwich that well. It sounds to me like the politics of, of mobility is very much focused on the car. Everything else is somewhat marginalized and very much on the fringe. And then within that spectrum of the politics of the car, we have everything from kind of individual rights to a collective approach. And the collective approach is car sharing. And that gets contested at the neighborhood level, but maybe also at the city level. And so that would be a street fight that you could bring up, right? Um, and that kind of raises interesting questions about who's able to exercise rights of mobility, because it seems like you have to have a driver's license, you need to be able to drive, you need to have access to a car in order to have full access to mobility. I don't know if that's an impression that you have from your city. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think maybe the redeeming feature is that it is quite a small city. So even if you can't drive, you could technically walk across the city and it's, mm -hmm. it's okay. Um, but yeah, I agree that it's very much like focused on the car. Um, yeah. I can see that we have about six minutes left and I don't wanna ignore this last question that I have on the slide, which is how we can support building greater mobility justice. And of course, this is a really big question. We could all write our PhDs on this question, right? So um, we're not gonna do it justice in these last five minutes, but I, it's something that I would like to, um, I'd like to plant a seed. And I hope it's a question that we can continue to consider um, in our work, but also throughout the, the video session that we have coming up next. Because many of you have kind of alluded to these in your discussions, and I've only heard two of the groups. So maybe the last two groups could reflect on this a little bit. What we hear is that some modes have more access in cities than other modes. Some people have access to all modes. Some people can drive a car, some people can walk, some people can take a bike or ride a bus, but others are kind of hindered. So how do we, in terms of kind of transitioning in systems, right, which is one of the focuses of this, this course, how do we think about ideas of mobility and justice and how might we understand a systematic change? Um, may I? Um uh, introduce our thoughts. Yeah, uh, we actually didn't discuss a very specific city. Mm -hmm. We, uh, in general, talk about our personal views of our countries. For example, I'm coming from Mexico. We have a, uh, another colleague from Iran and from Egypt. And we shared common um, thoughts about of this automobility and um, transition kind of impediments and drivers. Mm -hmm. And one of the key points that we brought is that we had, we need this shift of cultural and educational system. And I think that point supports this uh, greater mobility justice. 
because uh, one of the impediments we saw is, um, first of all, there is not a, an infrastructure to, to change to, to biking. Why not? Um, because it could be a, a shift of mind that streets are dangerous, uh, there is violence, that uh, people don't feel safe be riding a bike, or even if they did, uh, there is this uh, street struggle between cars and bikes that would mm -hmm. impede small kids riding a bike to school. Mm -hmm. So um, we need this shift starting from the government to try to re-educate, try to it have this seed into edu everybody's education so we could shift our, our perspective and um, start building um, infrastructure. Of course, it all comes, uh, as uh, some of my colleagues mentioned, it, it all comes, it all brings with uh, money and budget. Some, many times the price who get the most benefit are the ones who benefit cars. So uh, the, uh, we need, uh, we spoke, uh, we mentioned many examples about this uh, injustice regarding uh, people will not dare to just take a bike and uh, ride a bike because they are not safe because mm -hmm. uh, something out there could happen. Um, there is also this struggle, the street fighting with street vendors. And again, uh, 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 it's a regulation term in which government should include enough space for people to, to do these uh, hmm. activities. So yeah, uh, at the end, we, um, in general, we, we mentioned there is a, a huge need of change of culture and education. Um, I would love to hear um, your opinion about that. In, for example, we spoke whole America, Latin America, North America doesn't have this culture. And in our case, in Latin American countries, it isn't the fact that we don't want, it is the fact that there are not conditions established for that. Mm. So the system is, is not, there is not uh, a mobility justice implemented no. and it is not in the minds of the people, mm -hmm. not in, in the citizens and not in the government. Sure. Thank you for raising those really excellent points. And I think what needs to be said, uh, first of all, is that, of course, culture and educational shifts are needed. Yet, as you brought, brought up, I would suggest, and you were also suggesting that it needs to come from the government as well. So we need kind of a systematic shift and that requires budgetary implementation and prioritization in terms of kind of having multimodal um, approaches to understanding mobility. And we're gonna hear about that in the video. And we're gonna actually hear from the city of Bogota. So I think that'll be uh, very inspiring, uh, specifically from a Latin American perspective. What we can see is within Latin America and also Mexico, I don't know, are you from Mexico City or maybe another place? I do know that there are some programs that have been going on in terms of kind of getting folks on, on bikes. But it's, it's the same as in kind of a North American perspective that they're very kind of small or isolated. Um, they don't become holistic, right? Because the system is so car centric that we have kind of huge challenges that are faced, huge barriers. Yet if we started to do our homework and actually look at what was happening in terms of the politics of mobility and the certain street fights that are on the ground, we would see a lot of similarities to some of the street fights that I raised in Copenhagen. It's about parking, it's about highways, it's about taxes, and it's about kind of the political will to actually change things. And it's about citizens protesting or kind of being on the ground, trying to make things happen. So, well, Copenhagen is a place where we might see uh, easier approaches to political consensus, more of a um, homogenous population with less kind of strife or political unrest, as we can see in other parts of the world. We can see that some of these struggles can be understood within the ideological context, because neoliberal ideologies are found everywhere and, in fact, inflict a lot of kind of 
problems, you could say, within, uh, within mobility politics. Um, <clears throat> I think we need kind of a coupled approach, both a systematic change in terms of understanding um, uh, more just mobility. So if these cities um, from Latin American to North American to Asian cities are interested in actually um, meeting the Paris goals, what does it actually take? We have to think about transportation shifts and systemic shifts. Um, it's not just about shifting to electric vehicles and preserving the car culture, but we need to kind of think creatively. We need to think bottom up, which there's a great tradition for in Latin American cities, protests, taking to the street, taking back power, or at least trying to challenge the status quo. So there's a great potential there. Yet we also need governments to actually go in and acknowledge that the systems that we currently have don't necessarily work for the future and that there's a lot of potential to kind of change. And I would suggest that when, when we're in a time of crisis as we are currently, there's actually an opportunity to rethink the way that systems work. It's very optimistic and kind of um, maybe unrealistic to think that big changes can occur, but there is potential, right? So I think I would think about it both at the very systemic level and also at the individual level. A lot of people feel uncomfortable traveling, traveling with public transit right now. So what we see is that more folks are jumping into their cars because that's a private space. Yet in the US, what we've seen is that bikes are being ripped off the shelves because people have been trapped at home. So bicycles have been, become actually an outlet within this COVID time to kind of get out and to experience outdoor social distancing. So I think we have a real interesting tension here in terms of moving forward. And I mean, places like Tehran, places like Mexico City, um, all cities in Brazil right now are under siege with the COVID virus. So there is potentially an opportunity to think about kind of more personal or individual approaches based on uh, mobility. So based on kind of getting out on bikes, the question is, does it feel safe to do that? Right. And you bring that up that that's actually very difficult. And that's where the government needs to come in and start to intervene and provide that safe space. Um, I wish I could provide more insight into that because it's an incredibly important question. There actually is a lot of literature out there and I'm happy to provide uh, via email or chat some suggested uh, links and texts that could support that. Um, thought process. Thank you, yes. And of course, send me an email if you'd like to engage more. Thank you very much. Yes, I will. I think we've actually kind of hit our time limit here. So why don't we take a break and meet up again at 11?